Okay, so I've actually already introduced myself. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about using the immune system to treat cancer. Um, and this is what I do in my day job. This is what my research group is interested in. And this is what my patients are super interested in because um, they have all got cancer. And what we're using is gene therapy, so genetic engineering to alter immune cells so that they can recognize and kill cancer cells. And this is, I call it 21st century medicine because this is now becoming a reality. We're actually treating patients with genetically engineered immune cells um, in the building next to this at UCL and UCLH. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview and then finish off by talking to you about a project that I've just launched in my local secondary school where we're doing genetic engineering um, with a group of 20 year 12 students that we've just started and we'll spend the rest of this year working on and it links into one of the projects in my research group. Um, and actually, they are scarily intelligent, which is... Uh, in fact, I'm thinking of ditching all my PhD students because the Year 12 guys are much better. Don't tell my PhD students. So, cancer. This is like a noddy's guide to cancer. I've tried it out on my mother, who's 79, and sort of her memory's going. Um, but it's the accumulation of cells in our body that proliferate uncontrolledly. So the normal regulatory mechanisms that help a cell pass through the cell cycle are not working correctly. And actually, in reality, what it really represents is an accumulation of genetic mistakes and mutations over the years. And eventually, some of those mistakes, some of those mutations in important genes that encode or give the information to make a protein that's an enzyme or a receptor that is involved in cell proliferation and cell growth, those genetic mistakes, when the cells are copying themselves each time they divide, um, result in proteins that don't work properly. And you end up with a bunch of cells that are like a bunch of crazy toddlers in the room just charging about dividing and expanding and um, Wherever they are in the body, they can cause different symptoms and different problems. Cancer is much more common as we get older because we have the ability to have acquired more genetic mistakes as we get older. If you think about it, as you sit there, there are hundreds of millions of cells in your body dividing as we sit. They're faithfully trying to copy every single nucleotide of your strands of DNA so that the two cells they divide into are exactly the same and so that your liver cells always remain liver cells and they can function as liver cells, okay? But also, as new cells are formed, old cells need to die, otherwise you would just get bigger and... I mean, some of, some of us are getting bigger and bigger and bigger anyway. <laughs> I won't look anywhere. And, um, but actually, think about it. It's a completely controlled process. Okay? So every day, new cells are made, and old cells have to die. And if you make mistakes in any of the processes that regulate that, you can be in trouble. Okay. So when people... I'm particularly interested in blood cancers. I'm a blood cancer doctor. And these are some of the examples of things that can go wrong when you've got blood cancer. I think I've got a pointer. Everybody likes a gory photo. So you see this picture of an eye. You see that there? That's a pool of pus in the bottom of the eye. And that's actually leukemia cells. So white blood cells are actually um, the um, form pus. And if you've got abnormal white blood cells, they can collect in the bottom of the eye. Here you can see nodules, infiltration. These are cancer cells in the skin. These are particularly unusual type of blood cancer. If your bone marrow, which is inside of your long bones, it's where your blood stem cells live, and they produce the red blood cells, the white blood cells, the platelets, and all your cells of your immune system, it's basically like a factory inside your pelvis, your spine, and your long bones. So if you think of a bone as being a bit like a crunchy bar, if you cut it in half, inside all the little gaps are where all the cells nestle. The stem cells, the hemopoietic stem cells, live in these little niches. They 
divide. They survive your entire life and their job is to slowly replicate and produce daughter cells, which then differentiate into different types of blood cells and immune cells. If something goes wrong, and instead of having lots of different cells that have very important and specific jobs to do, red blood cells, you all know this, carry haemoglobin around the body, um, carry oxygen in, attached to the haemoglobin, white blood cells fight infection, platelets make your blood stick together and plug up holes when you cut yourself so you don't bleed. If instead of your bone marrow producing all these nice, normal, functioning cells all the time, suddenly one bunch of them start dividing like crazy and filling up the space, actually you fail to be able to make all the healthy cells because there isn't room and there aren't any nutrients or amino acids to make those cells. So you just make the mad, crazy, uncontrolled cancer cells and you don't make any of the normal healthy cells. And this thing here, in, this is a CT head scan, that's your brain. These are the ventricles inside the brain, the black bits. And this white lump is actually blood. So that's a massive hemorrhage inside someone's brain. And that's occurred because there aren't enough platelets being formed in the bone marrow because the patient has got blood cancer. Anyone recognize this? Any of the adults here know what that could be? Any biology teachers here recognize the shape of this? Blimey. Are any of you biology teachers? Stick your hands up so I can publicly embarrass you. Okay. <laughs> I'm teasing, really. That's a dermatome, okay? So that's a patch of skin that's supplied by a particular nerve. And in those nerve roots, particular viruses can lay dormant for the whole of our life. This is shingles. Okay, so that's a reactivation of chickenpox virus. When you're kids and you get chickenpox, you get spots all over you and blisters and itchy and you feel rubbish and you have a temperature and it's a pain in the neck for your parents because you're whiny and moany, depending what age you are, you might still be whiny and moany. Bear in mind, I've got three teenagers and mine are quite whiny and moany. Um, but the chickenpox virus goes away, but it stays, it remains in the nerve roots. And then if your immune system is affected by something else going on, it can reactivate. And it typically causes an infection and a rash in the actual distribution which that nerve root supplies. And it can be really, really painful um, because it's a, uh, the infection is in the nerve root. Okay, that was an aside. Standard treatments for cancer at the moment, chemotherapy, it's a fancy name for drugs, and these are usually drugs, they're tablets or injections or infusions, and their job is to prevent cells from dividing. So they can do all sorts of things that interrupt um, copying of DNA or uh, separation of cells or um, division of cells. So some of them are spindle toxins, some of them affect mitosis, some of them deplete uh, critical amino acids so the new cell can't be made because there aren't any proteins. Uh, proteins can't be made in the new cell. Some of my old-fashioned colleagues, who I take the mickey out because I think they're not clever, who are surgeons, think that they can get rid of cancer by just chopping it out. And actually, for many cancers, that can be very effective. But for lots of cancers, you only need a few of the malignant cancerous cells to be left behind. Bear in mind, they have a growth advantage compared to the normal cells because they proliferate more rapidly. They will potentially eventually relapse and reform the cancer. Some patients receive very fancy molecularly targeted drugs. This is a drug called Gleevec that we use to treat a form of chronic uh, leukemia. And actually, that's a drug that's been designed to sit in a pocket of a receptor that's abnormally activated when a particular mistake is made in the DNA of a cell. So this was actually the first designer cancer drug, and that's been in use for nearly 15 years now in the treatments of these patients with, with a type of uh, leukemia called CML. And their disease can be completely 
controlled so that they live a completely normal life by taking one tablet a day. So that's pretty revolutionary. This, anyone recognize this chap? Yeah, that's Alexander Litvinenko. He was a patient next door, and I looked after him. And he, um, this, is, this is just, um, I think it's, uh, uh, this is my quirky take on the use of radiation to kill cancer cells. So we use radiation and radiotherapy a lot. We don't use polonium in teapots because it's not very targeted. But in fact, um, poor Mr. Litvinenko died of radiation poisoning, um, probably, um, I don't know if this would be webcast courtesy of the KGB. If it is, I could be in trouble. But um, he was poisoned with radiation. We use targeted radiotherapy where we shine x-rays um, or isotopes at uh, particular parts of the body. The problem with all of those treatments is they only work while a drug or the radiation is in contact with the cancer cell. Okay, So as soon as the drug's been peed out or broken down by the liver and isn't there anymore, it can't have any impact or any effect on the cancer cell. And actually what we want is something that's going to last for a long time. And if the cancer cells recur, we'll still be effective. Okay, so this is why we're interested in using the immune system. Our immune system is made up of anything in our body that helps protect us from infection. So stupid things like the skin and our eyelashes, the nose up our hair, they're actually part of our immune system. My husband, when he was small, cut his eyelids off, eye, not eyelids, that would be terrible, his eyelashes off with a pair of nail clippers, which he found in the bathroom because he thought they were in the same shape as his eyelids. And his parents, who were both doctors, laughed at him and said, you'll wish you hadn't done that. He was about seven or eight at the time. And of course, they were right because he had about three months of recurrent conjunctivitis and realized actually that eyelashes are quite useful because they keep the bugs out of your eyes. So don't ever try that. Mostly, we're interested in a cellular immune response. So white blood cells in our, uh, circulating in our blood that are made in our bone marrow that help protect us from infections. And the cells that I'm particularly interested in are called T cells. And this is an electron micrograph of some T cells. And these are also called T lymphocytes. And they could be divided into killer cells and helper cells, depending on what kind of receptors are on their surface. So how do they work? Well... Actually, this is a slightly boring slide. This is a T cell with a nucleus, and this is a receptor. Okay, so the thing about scientists is not many scientists are very good artists, and I am one of them. So this is my receptor of a T cell, and it's recognizing a target cell that has a protein on its surface and a bit of peptide, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But this protein on the surface is a tissue-type protein. So when you hear about people having transplants and needing to find a match or a tissue match, what they're talking about is this protein on the surface of cells in the body. Because it's this protein that is like the docking station for the receptor of the immune cells. I'll skip over that. Because although it's animated, it's pretty rubbish, isn't it? And I'll, I'll move on to this. Now, this is an example of a scientist who is a very good artist. These slides were made for me by one of the postdocs in my lab called Pedro Velica. And this is a picture of a T cell. And the T cell has on its surface a receptor. It's a dimer, so two proteins, an alpha chain and a beta chain. And this is a normal cell in your body. And normally, your immune cells circulate through your bloodstream, they go to your lymph nodes, they go through your tissues, and they completely ignore all your normal cells in your body. And it's a good job they do, because if they didn't, you would get autoimmune diseases. If your immune cells just started willy-nilly attacking your own healthy cells, you'd be in trouble. Okay? So they're trained to ignore your normal cells. If... A virus comes along, mwahaha, 
this is an evil virus. It doesn't have to be that evil. Let's say it's chicken pox. Viruses are parasites, obligate parasites. They cause infection by getting inside cells. Okay, the cell gets activated and bits of viral protein are expressed on the surface of the cell. And this is the tissue type molecule and it's got a bit of virus protein in it. And so suddenly the T cell goes, oh, that's funny. That doesn't look like my normal cells. And its receptor sticks on to the tissue type protein and the bit of virus. And then the T cell gets hmm, activated. Hmm. And it makes lots of uh, vesicles, which contain uh, granzymes and enzymes. And these are spewed out and punch holes into the wall of the virally infected cell. And hey presto, the cell is killed. The very angry lymphocyte goes away and divides, as we've talked about. And he had produces an army of friends who are all able to fight the evil virus. And they go around the body and they find cells that have got bits of virus protein on the outside and they kill them all. And by this time, your viral infection has gone away and you don't need all your angry T cells anymore. So they go, some of them die off by a process called apoptosis. And then a few of them stay behind and go back to normal, to their resting state. And they stay in your circulation for the rest of your life. And if some while later you get infected by the virus again, they can immediately expand and kill the virally infected cells again. So we and a number of other people about 15 years ago thought, wouldn't it be fantastic if you could make immune cells that are trained to do that in our body to fight viral infections, if we could change them so that they could recognize cancer proteins and do exactly the same thing. So what we did was we wondered whether we could find T cells, immune cells in the blood that can recognize and kill cancer cells. So we know that our T cells don't recognize our normal cells and we know that they do recognize infected cells. But the problem with cancer cells, and my point is not very good, is a lot of cancer cells on the outside look very similar to normal cells. So actually the T cells wandering around going, oh, okay, that's a normal lung cell. Yeah, I know that's normal, I'm gonna ignore it. Uh, oh, oh, is that different? That looks sort of the same, but there's quite a lot of them. And I don't know, maybe it's a bit bigger and oh, not sure. And actually, it's quite hard. Unless there's very significant changes on the surface of the cancer cell, it's hard for the immune cells to recognize them. And sometimes what it is, is there's just an increased number of proteins on the surface of the cancer cell. And it's quite a hard job to get the immune cells to recognize cancer cells that have come from your own normal healthy cells. And this is an example. This is normal blood cells. And these are cancerous blood cells. And you don't have to be a highly trained scientist or doctor to realize that quite a few of these cells look quite similar to those cells, except they're cancer cells and they're normal cells. So we wondered if we could use gene therapy to help our immune cells kill cancer cells. And what we've done is used some molecular biology techniques whereby we have identified an immune cell that can kill cancer and we've worked out what the DNA sequence is for the receptor, that T cell receptor on the surface that helps the T cell recognize and bind to the cancer cell and kill them. And we've taken the DNA sequence that encodes the alpha and beta chain, so the proteins that make the receptor, and we've put them into an artificial virus. And we've used this virus to carry the genes into the immune cells. So they're new genes that give the instructions for a new receptor, and the new receptor can bind to and recognize cancer cells. So by making an artificial virus in the lab, we can then um, 
mix that with patients or healthy volunteers' own immune cells, the virus carries our DNA, our instructions for the new receptor. The virus does what a virus does, gets inside, infects the cell, delivers the DNA. It integrates into the host nucleus of the immune cell, and then the immune cell does what it thinks it should do and turn the genes into proteins, transcribes into mRNA and then translates into protein. The receptor assembles inside the endoplasmic reticulum. This is relevant for any of you doing biology. And then the receptor goes to the surface of the cell. And we can do this in the lab in a week. So you can take patient cells or healthy volunteer cells and turn them all into cells that can recognize and kill cancer. Okay, and what we do, this is probably, I don't know, I think you have to be a certain age to find this funny, but anyway, we use retroviruses as our tools to deliver these genes. And in a cartoon form, how, uh, normal, uh, unmodified retroviruses cause infections that can be serious, like HIV. But we can alter them by taking out um, pathogenic or disease-forming bits of DNA and turn them into a useful tool and add our DNA that provides the instructions to make a receptor. And we can clone this and we can turn the nasty evil retrovirus HIV into a really helpful lab virus that we can use to deliver our DNA. And so we can take blood from a patient, we can take the immune cells from the blood and we can mix them in a dish with our modified retrovirus, which gets inside the immune cell this time. Okay, so previously I showed you a picture of chickenpox virus getting inside tissues. And it gives the instructions for a new receptor. We can then end up with a gene-modified engineered T cell, and we can infuse that back into the patient. Okay. And does it work? Can it recognize cancer cells? Well, of course, it can in our fancy diagrams because uh, that's good. And I'll show you a bit of data at the, uh, in a second. The thing that's different about gene-modified immune cells is they're a one-off treatment. They're less toxic, potentially, than chemotherapy and radiotherapy because they're targeted. They can only recognize cancer proteins on the surface of the cancer cell. They can only recognize what your receptor is designed to recognize. And of course, if they behave like our normal immune cells do, that pr can protect us from chickenpox for the rest of our life, if they really work, they could potentially protect you so that you don't get a relapse of your cancer. And most people who die of cancer die because the cancer comes back, not because the initial treatment isn't effective. Okay, so some of our experiments we do in our research group involve using animals, um, and this is regulated very closely and tightly by the Home Office, and I'm a project license holder, which it means I'm responsible for uh, the running of um, the animals that we use in our experiments. Um, we won't be doing any animal work with the school in our school project. Um, but this, these are some mice, and they've been injected with tumor cells that have an enzyme called luciferase in them, firefly luciferase. It makes a really bright fluorescent light, and you can put these mice inside a camera that detects the luciferase. It, it, it detects the light that's emitted by the tumor. So as the tumor gets bigger, you get more light, and this is the signal here. And these mice... Um, their noses look funny because they're, they're being anaesthetized, so their noses are stuck into like little test tubes where the anaesthetic gas. So these aren't dead mice, these are alive mice who are asleep while we're imaging the tumor, and over time you can see it grows. And these mice have just been treated with their own immune cells. If we treat an equivalent group of mice with our gene modified immune cells, the reason I love this slide is because it's very visual. It shows you what happens. That The only difference between these mice and these mice is that these have been treated with T 
T cells or immune cells that have been genetically modified to carry a new receptor. And you can see there that the tumour's gone away. So we're very excited about that, and we're doing, and I'm in charge of a number of clinical trials where we're recruiting patients and treating them um, with gene-modified immune cells, and it's exciting, and we're treating patients in about eight centres in the UK, and we've just opened up hospitals to treat patients, or what are called trial sites, in uh, Brussels, France, and Germany. Um, one of the things we're really interested in, though, is making sure that our next trial is better than our current trial. And we haven't even finished our current trial. So back to your question about how do you keep things interesting, you've always got to be one step ahead. And the thing about T-cell receptors, so we're putting new receptors in our immune cells. We believe that the more immune cancer um, specific receptors we can have on the surface of the immune cell, the more potent they'll be. But actually, there's a rate-limiting step. So any of you doing chemistry will understand the concept of a rate-limiting step. In order for the receptor to be expressed on the surface of the immune cell, it has to form a complex with a molecule called CD3. So actually, if you put chuck in loads and loads of extra receptor into the immune cell, it's thinking, oh, what's going on here? I can't make enough receptor on the surface. I don't have enough CD3. I'm not making enough CD3. So we thought, oh, OK, well, maybe we'll give it receptor and we'll give it some CD3. And the CD3 molecule is a big protein. It's got lots of different chains. So we did some experiments in the lab where, as well as introducing our cancer receptor, um, we also introduced some extra CD3, and we thought maybe we'd get more receptor on the surface and the immune cells would be even better. And so we've got this gene construct here, which has the instructions to make all the different chains of the CD3 molecule. And what you can see here is that the mice in this experiment that were treated with our gene-modified immune cells, um, the tumour was cleared by the gene-modified immune cells. But if we put extra CD3 into the immune cells, as well as the gene-modified receptor, actually, the potency of these immune cells was even better. So we were even more effective at clearing the tumor. And what you can see here, this graph shows you the number of T cells that get to the site of the tumor. And so if they had been modified both with the receptor and with extra CD3, um, we got more of the immune cells to the tumour. So, this school, Graveney School, is in Wandsworth. It's a large state, main a state secondary school, um, and there are just over 2,000 kids in it. Um, my, I've got two sons there, one in year nine, who hates science and likes rugby. And that's about it, I think, to be fair. And I've got one in year seven who's a bit more of a SWAT. He likes football, um, but again, he says he doesn't like science. But there are, to give you an idea of the size of the school, there are 10 forms in my year seven son's class with 29 kids in each form. So it's a big school. And they have a really big sixth form with about 1,500 kids in it. And it's the biggest sixth form in London. And it's a fabulous school. It's about... Uh, seven minutes walk from my house. And I got contacted by Ed Simmons, who met Becky Parker at a uh, authentic biology meeting, and we decided to hatch a plan to do some gene engineering in school. So I went in at the beginning of... We were pl plotting it over last year, and I managed to get some funding from UCL to do this. And I've bought the time of one of the biology teachers so she can spend half a day a week on this project to prep um, a group of year 12 students. And I go in one day a week after school and spend an hour and a half with them in the lab um, doing, and we bought a load of equipment for their lab. So we bought PCR machines and um, things to do some molecular biology in their biology lab. So we kicked it off this September, so I'm a complete novice to this. 
I pitched up at the school to give an introductory lecture on cancer immunotherapy and we thought we'd give them the task of writing an essay to apply to be part of the projects. And we had 60 applications, 60 1,500 word essays, and we picked 20. We were going to just do 10 and we decided we couldn't just pick 10 students. Um, so we've got 20 students who've started this project. And the second week, they came up to UCL to look around the lab to meet all the postdocs and PhD students in uh, my institute. And that's those pictures there. This is Alice, one of my PhD students. These are the kids. And um, they're not kids. That's terrible, isn't it? The teenagers, the young people. And um, I then went into school with Alice. And for example, the school on all their school computers have downloaded a software program called Snap Gene Viewer, so where you can design uh, gene sequences. And this is the gene therapy vector. It's the one we use in our clinical trials. And I'm asking these year 12 students to make me some new vectors that contain all the separate parts of the CD3 molecule. Because our, my hunch is we don't need all of it. And we're going to design new vectors, and we're going to test them in school over the course of the coming year. So the half-term homework was to design a whole load of DNA primers for me, and I got these emailed on Friday of last week. And their biology teacher, they've been divided into four groups of five students, and each of group, this is obviously the SWATI group, because they've um, not just given me a sequence of DNA, uh, and I'll find out which students this one is. That's very minimal, but it might be totally accurate. So actually, they've worked out these sequences of primers, which are little bits of DNA that stick onto the genes, and then we'll do a PCR reaction and amplify and see if we can amplify that region of DNA. And actually, what they've asked me to do, instead of me check them, they've asked me just to order these primers, and we're going to check them by doing the PCR experiment in their lab, and we're going to do that next week. So if they've got the design of their primers right, they'll get a band of DNA on a gel in their school classroom. So wish me luck. I feel a bit like I'm flying by the seat of my pants. Uh, maybe we can have an update. But it's been funded by um, UCL and UCLH and um, inadvertently by the Department of Health, although they don't know yet. Um, <laughs> and um, anyway, uh, I hope it'll be really good fun. I'm really enjoying it anyway. Um, how do you get a mouse to have a tumour? Oh, that's a really good question. So, um, the easiest way to do it is we can breed mice that have um, themselves um, abnormalities in their own immune system. So, they're what we call immune deficient mice. And then we can inject either under the skin or into their tummies or into their veins and the vein we tend to use in mice is the one that runs down their tail at the back because it's quite big we can inject um, tumor cells that come from biopsies from patients and because the mice have no functioning immune system themselves they don't reject they don't kill the human tumors so the tumors can grow inside the mice and the reason we use that as our model is when I sit down with a patient and say, I, I've got this really great idea, I want to give you some gene-engineered immune cells, um, but I haven't tried them on another human being yet, is that okay? Um, actually, what you need to say to them, the, and the, they could ask you many questions, but one of the questions would be, how do you know your immune cells will get to where my tumour is? How do you know that when they get there, they'll survive for very long? How do you know when they get there that they'll recognize the tumor and kill it? So there are lots of questions, and you can test all of those in mice first, because you can inject your gene-modified immune cells in a vein a long way from the tumor. And if they're able to recognize the tumor, they'll get there, and they'll kill it. That's one last question. 
First of all, I have to apologise for being a biology teacher. <laughs> and, uh, and these guys in here will be learning about SCID which, yes. uh, um, uh, uh, and gene therapy yes. as part of their yes. specification. Um, and the problems with the gene therapy for there was was it because there was a stem yes. cells yes. And, and then it, and the integrated into a uh, tumor suppressor gene. Yes. Is that not a problem for you guys because you're using? Did, how long do your T cells that you inject into the patients last for? Do they, okay. Are they not? They're not stem cells, I'm assuming. No. Just... So that is a really, really good question. And in fact, I. Um... I work very closely with a chap called Adrian Thrasher at Great Ormond Street who did the original SCID trials here. And um, we're talking about when you use a, a retrovirus or a, a, to deliver new genes into a cell, they get randomly integrated into the genome inside the nucleus. And if they sit next to a gene and switch it on inappropriately, actually just you using a virus to deliver genes could end up being a really bad thing if you randomly insert your genes next to a gene that switches the cell into a uh, cell cycle. And when they treated some of the first children with this very severe form of immune deficiency, out of the first 20 patients that were treated, five of them developed a leukemia in the, in the T cells that arose from the stem cells. And there are two things. You're exactly correct that it's because the, the new gene inserted next to a known oncogene, so a known gene that helps cause cancer. But the stem cells themselves are the cells in our body that have the most proliferative potential. So they're undifferentiated. They've got open chromatin, and they can rapidly proliferate in response to a transforming um, events such as integration in the wrong place. If you use a r exactly the same vector to infect or transduce a terminally differentiated cell, so an, a lymphocyte will last forever, but it's differentiated, um, you don't get the same. And, and there's been about 620, at last count, because we have to keep a running tally of this, globally there's been about 620 patients treated with gene-modified T cells, and there hasn't been a single case of leukemic transformation. And so there's factors to do with the vector, factors to do with the oncogene, and factors to do with the cell that you're modifying. And I th we think the biggest risk is when you're modifying an actual stem cell. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Fantastic. <laughs>